Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Greetings and welcome everybody on YouTube to the Brett Norman Broadcast Network channel. And today is Sunday, March 10th, 2019, and he, we are here with Daryl Everhart and Yerk Lisman to read the Divine Program of the World's History by Albert Close. And we just finished the first section, the first 70 pages. And this book is a little different because the numbering of the pages starts from zero or one at the second part of the book which is The Divine Program of European History by Albert Close. Calendar of Leading Events of Church History for the Last 1900 Years. Boy, this does not sound like a small topic. It's huge. And Yerk and Daryl, you're both much well qualified to... Uh, study this along with me because this is a uh, 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 very, very big doozy here. It says in the first line, it says, quote, Rome was not built in a day, unquote. And here in America, where I grew up, we have uh, very little recognition of Rome in our Lutheran church where I was brought up and raised. Um, uh, they didn't tell us much about Rome. Um, other than they're Christians. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we can talk about fallacies and uh, 
um, cognitive dissidences and things like this, and, and there is plenty of them in the Lutheran churches, and I am so glad to say that I am no longer a Lutheran in that sense. So, I want to welcome both of you, dear brothers in Christ, and uh, boy, Daryl, can you help us out here? Sure. It's, <clears throat> number one, it's great to be on with both of you, and uh, I love history, so um, I love uh, all kinds of history. I, like, uh, I love church history. Of course, the history I love the most is the one that's told from the Bible and from the Bible standpoint and the old King James for English-speaking people. But uh, I love European history. I love ancient history. And uh, as the Spanish-born American philosopher George Santayana said, and I'm paraphrasing him, if we don't learn from the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of history. And that's why it's important to learn from from history and take a look at uh, what happened to the true believers throughout history, and we find a, a horrendous history of bloodletting, of uh, slaughter of Bible-believing Christians from the get-go. Whenever uh, the Roman church morphed into what it was, they were a persecuting church from the day of their birth. Let's put it that way. And they followed... Uh, uh, their daddy's uh, uh, machinations, and of course their daddy is Lucifer, Satan, because if you study the the history of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, you'll see that, uh, and people have documented this very well, like Alexander Hislop and others, um, that the Babylonian roots of Roman Catholicism run extremely, extremely deep. And we need to know that. And um, uh, we did a YouTuber the uh, other day there, uh, uh, Yerk and I, where we talked about the Marian apparitions and that. So Mary, indeed, as I, I had stated on there, is the star of uh, Roman Catholicism. As I was growing up, and as I had mentioned before, m my Catholic friends told me, uh, well, Jesus may be the head of the church, but Mary's the neck. Mary's the, you go through Mary to get to Jesus, and the Roman Catholic Church has always put something, someone, between the person seeking God the Father other than Jesus Christ. They'll put the priest, they'll put Mary, they'll put dead saints, anything and anybody else because they don't want you to have a personal relationship with your Heavenly Father, and they don't want you to go through the one mediator that the Bible very clearly says there's one, not a co-mediatrix, not a extra couple, the priests and stuff, but there is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, period. So that's what we try to uh, exalt the Bible, and we exalt uh, the uh, the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and who is the true head of the church, and we expose the Antichrist, who is the a great adversary of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so, how's that for an introduction, guys? Beautiful. That's what we Thank you. Do. Wonderful. We I only think that you have a little problem with your microphone there, Daryl. I don't know what it is, but it's it the seems... phone connection. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. It's a phone connection, but it seems like you are. You're having a beard and go, going to the microphone with that or something, or too close no, to the mic. No. Or, it's it? the connection, I can tell. It's the connection. Yeah, it it could be that we need to call you back, Daryl, to fix it, sure, or I don't I can, know. Do you want me to hang up Would and call me right back? Would that work out quick, Yerk, if you just quick um, yeah, then I hang just, up, Daryl? Then I and just then, have to cut the whole call and uh, do the call no, again, no. right? Actually, no, Daryl just needs to hang up, and then we need to add him again. Oh, okay. That's all. Okay. I think. Good, Daryl. Okay. Then. Hang up and then we'll see you in a sec, Daryl. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, those. Once are in a while, we gotta have these little technical issues. Well, let's see. Let's call him back. So. Let's. Add Beautiful. Him. Yep. 
Okay. Thanks, Yerk. We'll okay. see if this solves the problem. It should. Technically. Hopefully that's better. Oh, yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that happens sometimes, so, you know. But we're still recording, we are still on it, and uh, it was a wonderful intro that you did, Daryl. Uh, absolutely correct. I don't have any, many things to, to add to that anyway. Um, I want to get right to the point, because this book sure. that Albert Close uh, left us with is uh, quite a doozy to get in and study. And you remember that probably because of our last time when we were going through this um, Edict of Toleration from 1844. That is still something that uh, we still have to look deeper into and probably you, the viewer, also has to look a little bit deeper into. I cannot imagine that you say, oh, it's all, um, it's all very clear to me right now. Um, anyway, this book study, and let me repeat this because this is of utmost importance that you, uh, that you all understand it. This book study that we are doing leaves here and there questions, leaves here and there uh, open points for quote-unquote discussion um, because it teaches something else than you are used to. And also, um, this book is not the Bible, so there can be mistakes in this book. Yeah, and you have to understand that, and therefore, of course, we try when we read this book to erase all the errors that are in there. But we don't see everything in there. We don't understand everything that's in there. So that's why we call everybody who watches these videos to do their own research in this regard. And maybe when you come up with another solution, then we provide it during the reading or whatever. You can put that in the comment section of the video, and you can share your research, serious, biblical-based research on this. Don't come up with what um, Michael Tsarian said or what uh, Jordan Maxwell said or Alex Jones said or mm -hmm. um, Eric John Phelps said or Walter Feit said. I am not interested in those. I'm interested in when you have a real revelation from the Holy Spirit during your own study and that you came up with a better solution than we came up with here. Yeah, That's one very important point I wanted to make before I start the study today. So if you brothers are all right with it, then I'm going yeah, right point into the well book right made. now. That's a very good point. Well made, Jörg. Thank you. Good. Roger. Let's go. <clears throat> okay, let's go. So, The Divine Program of European History by Albert Close. It is on page 71 in the book, on page 44 in the PDF. Uh, calendar of leading events of church history for the last 1900 years. And I can tell you we are stumbling already on the next page into a quote-unquote little mistake he made. But I'm also going to take the time just to go a little bit back because here I counted to you this 75 years and uh, seeing about a year has quote-unquote a biblical year 360 days, a solar year um, has uh, 365.24 days, a lunar year has uh, 354 days, you know. I never came up to 75. Why didn't I come up to 75? Well, because I counted 2,520 and not 2,300. I should have counted 2,300. So this is my rectification of a misunderstanding of the last reading we did. I just came to that conclusion that I did the wrong calculation and counted 2,520 instead where I should have counted 2,300. That gives us the difference of these few years why I don't come to 75 years, which were the 75 years between 1844 and 1919. 1844, with the Edict of Toleration, set in was the beginning of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, and 1919 was the total destruction of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was departed into different countries as we know them today in the Middle East, which, of course, since 1948 includes this nation-state of Israel that is still, to my understanding, completely unbiblical that it is there because there's nothing holy in this world anymore. And if anything is holy, then only God can make it holy and no man. Okay? But I just wanted to rectify that little mistake we did there. So now we are going into that calendar of leading events of the church history for the last 1900 years. And as Brett already mentioned... 
the author says, Rome was not built in a day. I don't know how you Americans are um, familiar with this saying, but it's a saying that we use over here in Europe very, very often. Yeah, You know, when something has no hurry to do, well, take your time. Rome wasn't built in a day, too. You know, it takes time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, that's it's used great. over here also. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but we use it really very much here because I had, the, uh, I had the impression that when Brett read it first, he said, okay, that's interesting, but I haven't heard that that much. So <laughs> that's why I'm saying that. Well, that's true. We haven't heard it much here. No, you see, you uh, probably that differs from state to state. You in Minnesota yeah, are a little well, bit back on Pennsylvania, person then, person right? Person to person, Yeah. Or person to person. Anyway, Rome was not built in a day means that a good thing needs some time. But building Rome was not a good thing, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it is commonly said that Rome was not built in a day and assuredly the Roman Catholic Church did not burst full-blown upon the world. She rose into power gradually. Huh? It was a little horn coming out of the ten horns, growing and growing and growing as the old Roman Empire decayed and passed away. The Church of Rome gradually introduced heathen Babylonian rites ceremonial yep. and doctrines or ceremonies and doctrines into the Christian church until in the course of ages these completely supplanted the doctrines and teachings of Christ and the apostles if you want to do a little more deeper study of this fact then I can advise you two books to read one is the book from Ralph Woodrow from 1966 a Babylon mystery religion which is very accessible, which is a very, quote-unquote, easy read. Yeah. Some 160-some pages, right, Daryl? Correct. I'm holding it in my hand right now, 163 pages. Ah, you see, I was closer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the other book that has a little bit more pages, that's about 500 pages, that is from uh, Alexander Islop, written in 1853, and uh, for the first time completely published in 1858, the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And then you really get a deep study, a deep introduction into what we've just read here about the development of the Roman Catholic Church and its connections to ancient Babylon. Yeah? That is very, very interesting to read. So it really took time for the church to develop to what it is today. Today, the author continues, the doctrines of the Church of Rome are those of ancient Babylon, simply tinted and, var uh, and varnished with Christian names and titles. Or as I like to say, it was the baptism of the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity. Mm -hmm. And by that, Christianity was hijacked. Yeah? Hislop in his The Two Babylons clearly traces the mass extreme unction, purgatory, prayers for the dead, idol processions, relic worship, the rosary, the worship of the sacred heart and of the holy heart, the priest with the shaven crown, the host, speaking of the Eucharist, holy water, adoration of images, celibate priests, Pontifex Maximus, etc., etc., etc. I could go on until tomorrow, but that's not the point. All of this to ancient Babylon. Christ and the apostles never taught these strange doctrines, and they are not in the New Testament. So, where did they come from? Well, from the old pagan religions of pagan Rome, pagan Greece, pagan Egypt, and pagan Babylon. The following calendar taking the crucifixion of Christ as the starting point may prove helpful to those not acquainted with these facts in tracing the rise of Romish apostasy. That's why we are going into the 70 weeks of years before Christ came. Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. That is the next subchapter we are dealing with. It has been chiefly from much it has been taken chiefly from much more extended calendars in Eliot's Horae Apocalyptica and Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness's Approaching End of the Age. Note how the period of 1260 years extends between the great hilltops of history and has again and again and again marked stages 
of development and downfall in the history of the papal and Mohammedan powers. 1260 years seems to be one of the great rounds of God's chronometer. Man has his little 12 hours chronometer, which makes its round in 12 hours. God has its great astronomic chronometer, which seems to strike when 1,203 score years from great starting points in papal and Mohammedan history have run their course. 1,203 score years is an astronomic cycle. We read from the King James Version, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 5, 6 and 7, where it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. So we just understood that there will be seven weeks, and then there will be threescore and two weeks, that makes together sixty-nine weeks. And after threescore and two weeks, preceded by the first seven weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and until the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, and this is of utmost importance, He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So far, Daniel chapter 9, one of the utmost important to understand parts of the whole Bible, because the wrong interpretation of this lays the basic for the futurist teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits who put this out in the open. Now the author says, from the issuing of the commandment by Artaxerxes in the Persian in BC 457 to restore and to build Jerusalem to the crucifixion of Christ, there extend 70 weeks of years or 490 years. No. And this is what I think is a mistake of the author here. From issuing the commandment by Artaxerxes to restore and build Jerusalem to the crucifixion of Christ, there are 486 and a half year. Correct. Why? Because it says, and this is why the sentence is there in green, in the midst of the week he shall cause the yeah. sacrifice and oblation to cease. So we understand. Yeah, so you, you, can, you can directly say something. I just want to finish my sentence, please. And then I would oh, like sorry. both of you. No, I, I would like of both of you to fall in there. It's, it's just I count on your contribution on this. I just want to finish my sentence first. And then, please, I, 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 love, I welcome your comments. We just read between Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 and 27, that it is 70 weeks that are determined upon, uh, determined upon thy people and thy holy city. The Archangel Gabriel speaking to Daniel, and when he says, Thy people and thy holy city, he speaks of the people of Daniel. So we have no question that those are the Jews who are in captivity in Babylon. And 70 weeks are determined upon these people. And then he says, In seven weeks, it shall be, uh, Jerusalem shall be re uh, rebuilt, and 62 weeks also, and then the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So we have 62 or three score and two weeks and we have the preceding seven weeks makes it 69. And then it says in verse 26 and after the three score and two weeks 
which have been preceded by seven weeks, which means after 69 weeks. And after 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the world desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week. So that means Jesus Christ is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week, that is seven years. But in the midst of the seven years week, he shall cause the sacrifices and liberations to cease, because he was crucified. So then is only half of the 70th week still passed on. This means Jesus, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth, as the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7 and so many other prophecies, was three and a half years in the flesh and three and a half years in the spirit after Pentecost. So when the author says here, from issuing the command of Artaxerxes, to restore and build Jerusalem to the crucifixion of Christ, there extend 69 and a half, um, no, not 69, and, yeah, 69 and a half yeah, weeks. Yeah, so that is clear. 486 and a half years. Because it says very clear in verse 27, in the midst of the week. The week, you can also read, in the midst of the 70th week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Because Jesus Christ was crucified at the day of Passover in three and a half years into his ministry, his earthly ministry, his fleshly ministry that is recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And he went to the cross and then he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease because at the moment when Jesus Christ on the cross gave up the ghost, the uh, veil and the temple was red from top to bottom to expose the holiest of the holiest so that there were no more sacrifices possible in that temple and his words came into fulfillment that God does not dwell in temples made of stone anymore and the author here makes this quote unquote mistake I call it to say that from 475 through the uh, to the crucifixion, 490 years passed. No, 486 and a half years passed. And it is very important that we understand that Jesus Christ's ministry was uh, prolonged three and a half years again by the apostles at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came over them and they continued to preach the kingdom of God to the Jews and when the 490 years were really over, and that's again another point of discussion that we come to on the next page, when the 490 years really were over, and the gospel turned to the Gentiles, then the 70th week was fulfilled, because it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So, the Jews have gotten 70 weeks of which there were 69 and a half weeks uh, fulfilled when Jesus went to the cross and the last three and a half years, the last half week was finished by the Holy Spirit who Jesus Christ sent because he said, if I do not go away, the Comforter cannot come and the Comforter will lead you into all truth and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age with the Holy Spirit. So, that's the point that I wanted to make, and now I'm very eager to hear what Brett and Brother Daryl have to say. Sorry for this long explanation, but I really wanted to say this first, and now I really want to hear you two brothers falling into this same uh, subject. Please, Brett. Mm -hmm. Daryl, do you have anything on the top of your mind? I just want to say that I agree 100%, and there's nothing to really add. The Lord... Jesus Christ got cut off halfway through that week, period. It's, you know, that's very clear. And to, to say that uh, he didn't, well, you know, you start getting into all of the, uh, uh, the futurist type stuff, interpretations and that, but uh, they understand the big problem that the dispensationalists and all of the futurists make is they take a prophecy that applied to the Lord Jesus Christ and they 
turn it around and apply it to the Antichrist at the end of, supposedly at the end of time. So, no, Yerk did a very good explanation there. There's nothing to add. No, there isn't. Thanks, Yerk. Even you have nothing to add to this. Well, I just can't help but be quiet. I, I should mute my <laughs> mic or something while you're talking because I'm sorry, but that's just how it works with me. I'm just like, no, wow. Just because yeah, I interrupted that is you. Spot on. I, it's just because no, I no, interrupted no. you there before and I, I, I don't. No, want you, to no, cut no, you no. Off, you you know? didn't interrupt. I just was saying spot on, man. Oh, okay. Good. That's all. Good. Then we continue in the book, right? Yeah. Right. The foundation of the Christian Church in A.D. 33. This great prophecy was fulfilled to a day on the year-day scale of symbolic prophecy and supplies us with the key to all other symbolic prophecy. Christ is the center of all and everything, and please let us not forget that. Yeah? It's not right. our will, it's not our understanding, it is Christ who is the center of all and everything. And if we cannot humble ourselves and submit ourselves to the will of our Lord, but say, oh, but my understanding is much better than that what Christ says, um, I guess then we are wrong. And this also counts here for this author. We have to be very, very careful when we read this work of a man. And there's no problem that it is his work. The point is that we have to understand this book is not the Bible. This book, this book is not the unfallible, inerrant word of God. This book is the work of a man trying to explain to other men history. And we are very great for Albert Close to do it. But when here and there are mistakes, we have to point them out and we have to try to find them out. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because now he comes with a timetable that to me has no biblical reference. He says in 33 AD, that's the symbolic prophecies centering around Jesus Christ were fulfilled on the year-day scale, so are all others when they form part of symbolic prophecy. He starts in 33 AD, death, resurrection and ascension of Christ. I think we all agree on that. That was about 33 AD. Mm -hmm. Because he was 30 when he was baptized, and then he did his ministry in the flesh for three and a half years, went to the cross, and then he continued his ministry three and a half years through the Holy Spirit, as I just explained. So that's about 33 AD, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. There's also a dispute with many people if that was 33 AD, because Jesus Christ may have been born one, two, or three years before the year zero. Yeah? That would make this yeah, 30 true. AD. So don't take everything for granted, the author says here. This is very important to understand. We cannot just take all these words and say, okay, that's so. And it will come even uh, more sure the farther we read here. Also in 33 AD, foundation of the Church of Christ at Jerusalem. Okay, let us see that that was uh, Pentecost. Okay? 33 AD also, Christ's ascension. Yeah, that was, what is, what is it, 40 days? 50 days, 40 days after the crucifixion. May AD 33, received chronologically. And then in 35 AD, formation and consolidation of the Church of Jerusalem, which we can read in Acts 2, 42 through 47, Acts 4, 33 through 37, Acts 5, 13, 14, and 34 through 40. Now, I looked at all these verses, and I can tell you that it's absolutely correct about the formation and consolidation of the Church of Jerusalem, but it never, ever, even one time gives you a hint of the time past. Because he continues to say, then comes Stephen's martyrdom. And you know that many people say Stephen's martyrdom, when Stephen was martyred, that was the moment when the Gospel turned to the Gentiles. Now, Brett and I, together with our German brother Michael, we did a deep study of the Book of Acts, and we did not come to the conclusion that Stephen's martyrdom, that the stoning of Stephen, was the end point of bringing the Gospel to the Jews, and then the Apostles turning to the Gentiles, but that must have been a later point, because you cannot even see within the first eight chapters of Acts, and that is where Stephen's martyrdom takes place, that's in chapter 8, or chapter 7, 
Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, chapter 7, right? That's chapter oh, seven. I don't know right now. Yeah, I think it's uh, chapter 7. Don't ask me. <laughs> anyway, in, in these first uh, books of the Bible, in the, of, of the book of Acts, there is no hint anywhere how much time passed by. But it is quite sure that Stephen's martyrdom cannot have been taking place three and a half years after Jesus Christ's crucifixion. It is more likely that it took place right the next year. That would only have been one year away. Now, after Stephen's martyrdom, you have Paul's conversion. Now, how can the gospel turn to the Gentiles when Paul is not, when Saul is not even converted into Paul and Paul is the epistle to the Gentiles? Not possible. There is a later part, I think it is in Acts chapter 13, where Peter says that it was him to him, to whom was appointed to bring the gospel to the Gentiles because of the story of Cornelius with the Italian band. But that's only that one family, because Peter for the rest was preaching the gospel all the rest of his life to the Jews in Babylon, speaking in Asia, Asia Minor, traveling there around, even going to Babylon, the ancient Babylon where the Jews were captive for 70 years. There he went to bring the gospel to the Jews. Paul went all through Asia, um, all through uh, Greece, Italy, probably even to Spain and England, which is not proved anyway, Um, but he maybe has been there through his journeys. He did four or five journeys, and we go into that a little bit later here. But before Paul was converted, um, the gospel could not have gone to the Gentiles. So first we need Stephen's martyrdom. After Stephen's martyrdom we have the conversion from Saul to Paul. But then it really takes time before he goes into the Gentile and and teaching the Gentiles. It says here, Damascus, that is chapter uh, 9, verse 19. That's Paul's conversion. Now three years he is partly in Arabia, partly in Damascus under Aretas. And he writes Second Corinthians, or it is written in Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses 30, 32, 33, Acts chapter nine, verses 23 and 25. Then begins Saint Paul's missionary journeys. Yeah? Saint Paul's visit to Jerusalem was 40 A.D. He says here all of a sudden. I don't know where he gets these years from. And the problem I have with this book and with this dates that are set here is that these dates cannot be measured against the Bible. So they are written here, and you say, oh, but yeah, that makes sense. But let's go a little bit down in the book here. And we see Mm. all of a sudden that it says here, the Gospel of Mark was written between 50 and 60 AD. And that is according to Harnack, in a book that he published in 1911. The books of Matthew, Luke, and the Acts written before A.D. 70 in the book of Harnack in 1811 written. Now, Harnack, you have to understand who Harnack is. I'm going to show you who Harnack is. He is a German uh, teacher, a German Protestant. I looked him up yesterday, Adolf von Harnack. That's him. That's the way you pronounce his name, Adolf von Harlach. And he did many publications and he had uh, a very interesting life and all that. But there is nothing even here in his biography on Wikipedia or whatsoever where he measures the Bible on the things that he says. It says that he is an historian and that he looks into these and this and this, but he cannot make it from biblical point of views out. He lived mm-hmm. in the time he lived in the time of the higher criticism. And you know that higher criticism came from Germany, right? And he was right. and he was against this higher criticism, but that, that it still is possible that he was influenced by it. Yeah? Um, he was born in 1851, died in uh, June 1930. He was a Baltic German Lutheran theologian and prominent church historian, produced many religious publications from 1873 through 1912. Well, we have this here in 1911 mentioned here, which, by the way, I don't find in these publications. 
in which he is sometimes credited as Adolf Harnack. He was uh, ennobled with addition to Fon of his name in 1914. So that is, uh, Fon means that he has been put into nobility. Uh, when you have the name Fon in German there, um, then you are put into quote unquote nobility. Yeah? Only nobility has the name von und zu und auf und davon and so on and so on and so on. Harnack traced the influence of Hellenistic philosophy on early Christian writing and called on Christians to question the authenticity of doctrines that arose in the early Christian church. Yay. He rejected the historicity of the Gospel of John in favor of the Synoptic Gospels, criticized the Apostles' Creed and promoted the Social Gospel. Mm. In the 19th century, higher criticism flourished in Germany, establishing the historical critical method as an academical standard for interpreting the Bible and understanding historical, the historical Jesus. In Tübingen School, Tübingen of course is a Jesuit university, Harnack's work is part of a reaction to Tübingen and represents a reappraisal of tradition. Besides his theological activities, Harnack was a distinguished organizer of sciences. He played an important role in the foundation of Kaiser Wilhelm uh, Gesellschaft uh, Cooperation and became even its first president. And then it goes on over his life here. And I read about it and I read through it and it doesn't say anything of um, how he biblically measures what it is said here. So all this, and that's what I want you to understand, all these years that I mentioned here, uh, 50 to 60, 60, 59, 57, 55, 54 AD, mm. 52, 50, 49, 47, 50, 40, with Paul Schmiss and all that stuff, all this, all this is just what people even assume. Because Harnack, and that's the point I wanted to make here, Huh? Harnack put the Gospel of Mark and Matthew and Luke and Acts written before AD 70, which absolutely makes sense. I have no, I have no doubt of that, because many other people said those were written after. Yeah? Um, therefore, we have to go into this little footnote here. I, I know I jump over this. Uh, chronologically here, but that is no problem. Let's go into this little footnote here, where mm -hmm. the author tells us, Harnack has recently abandoned the post AD 70 date of these Gospels, speaking of the Gospel of Mark, Matthew and Luke, and the Book of Acts. Okay? Harnack has recently abandoned the post AD 70 date of these Gospels. Sir W. M. Ramsey's research in the East has confirmed the earlier dates of origin. I don't doubt that. The new theology organs, the Christian world and other rationalist religious papers edited by self-styled advanced thinkers were strangely silent on this point when Professor Harnack of Berlin University declared before the Archbishop of Canterbury in the cream of the scholars of Britain in the Queen's Hall in 1911 that he saw no reason now to think these books were written after A.D. 60. They published whole pages concerning Harnack and his lecture. The British Weekly alone of our, uh, of our great religious papers reported his supremely important pronouncement concerning the early origin of these Gospels. Now, why, these si why this silence? Right? We are speaking of the silence of the uh, people of the higher criticism. Okay? Why are they all of a sudden silent? Because they preached that uh, Matthew, Luke, Book of Acts, Mark are all written after 70 AD. Harnack comes up and says, no, that was written earlier, and they were silent. Why? These rationalist religious papers and the profound thinkers who write for them have for years been teaching that these books were written after the destruction of Jerusalem, or after AD 70. They, speaking of the profound thinkers, yeah, these people of higher criticism, criticism, they cannot believe that our Lord Jesus Christ was deity and a prophet who foresaw and foretold in wonderfully minute detail the destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jews. 
Therefore, they contend Luke 21, verse 22-24 was written after AD 70, after Jerusalem had been destroyed. These facts explain their silence respecting Harnack's latest pronouncement. The denial of our Lord's deity and eternal self-existence lies at the root of this silence. Yeah? That's the problem these quote-unquote smart people have. Yeah? They deny the Lord's deity and eternal self-existence. The Christian World correspondent of February 9, 1911 stated that he specially sought for some pronouncement on the questions of the day, yet here was a pronouncement of the first magnitude passed over in silence. Would there have been silence had Harnack distributed their, uh, attributed their origin to AD 80 to 100? That's the question. So the point is that these quote-unquote scientists have a problem attributing to when these different books of the New Testament were written. They have a problem to attribute to the correct year the writing of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John of the book of Acts and of all the other books. And this is something that we see when we go back into this, chronologi uh, uh, into this uh, chronologically here. Yeah? Because it says here, um, we have in the year 40 that Paul visits Jerusalem, second visit of, uh, with arms for famine, home mission in Tarsus and Cilicia. So uh, they all of a sudden have a gap here, not between 33 and 35 for two years. This is quite explanational uh, to, to, to be explained, even though I don't think Stephen's martyrdom took place in 35 when Christ's crucifixion took place in 33. But all of a sudden you have a jump of five years here. And how do you say that? Because biblically you cannot see this jump of five years. Is that all by assumption? They say Paul's first great missionary tour in Acts chapter 13, 2 and 3 took place between 47 and 50. What, what did he do all these seven years in between? All this year? Home mission in Tarsus and Cilicia? Uh, I don't know. And why do they get this that it took so here? Because he has mentioned for one, in Antioch he stayed for a whole year. Yeah, but that's about all that is mentioned in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is not a report like you have in a diary, where mm -hmm. it is written this day and that year happened this, this day and that year happened that. It is not put that way. God does not want to pull it that way, and he has his reasons. And who are we to make something out of the word of God that is not explicitly written in the word of God? Well, then we believe our own teaching, and we believe our own mind, rather than we believe the mind of our Lord. And that's what I absolutely refuse. So to me, I can jump over this little table of, uh, of years running through here, just trying to get to you the understanding that we just read here that even Harnack and, and even the other people of high criticism later on agreed that the gospel more or less completely was finished before Jerusalem was destructed. And I agree with that. It wouldn't make sense even otherwise. Meaning having the destruction of, uh, of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the 10th uh, army, or, or what's it called, um, of, of Titus, of the Roman, and destroy Jerusalem completely, and those uh, Gospels and those biblical books were not yet completed. To me, it doesn't make sense. They have to be, mm -hmm. have had to be completed before. And the mm -hmm. one that is surely completed afterwards, that is the book of Revelation, because that was in the time when John was uh, banned or exiled to the island of Patmos, and that was in the late 90s of the first century, to my understanding. But all these other years they put here, there is no biblical reference to be found on that, because in the in the uh, in the Bible it mentions us here and there that there is a um, a little place set aside here, and a little place he was there, a little time he was there, but nothing sure about it what it was. So, to me, this is all or less, more or less all presumption. 
And what I don't want to do is read a book and just base it on presumption. I want to base it on the facts. And if the Bible doesn't give me the facts, and I don't see the facts out of this writing here, then I'm just going over it. And that's the point that I want to explain here. Huh? I get over it. <sighs> okay. Mm. Brothers. Yes. Any, any... Quite a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I told Quite a doozy, you. Yerk, and you're spot on, and I'm right there with you. Okay, so, Daryl, you too? Yeah, I'm with you. Go ahead and continue. Yeah. Okay. Now, where, of course, it gets interesting is when we go here into the years 60 or something, because here we have some historic records, even outside of the Bible, that, for, for uh, example, speak in 65 AD, the second imprisonment at Rome. Uh, at that second imprisonment, he wrote Second Timothy, uh, or, or we can read about this, uh, sorry, we can read about the second um, uh, imprisonment in Rome in Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. And the books that are written there was uh, Timothy, Titus, first and as uh, first and second Timothy and Titus. And we understand that when we read these books in the Bible, we understand that he wrote this from his imprisonment in Rome. Then comes Paul's martyrdom. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, he says in one of the Gospels, and therefore um, he knows that his worldly death is fast approaching here in 65 AD. Before that we have in 64 the great fire at Rome, you know, that was laid by Nero. Christians were accused of having caused it, and they suffered cruel persecutions. This first persecution lasted four years, so that's from 64 through 68. Josephus, a contemporary of the Apostles, and by that not someone who is in the Bible, but who is a historian of this world, writing specially for pagans, has left on record in his work Antiquities, Book 20, Chapter 9, that, quote, Ananus assembled the Jewish Sanhedrin and brought before it James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and others to be stoned as infractors of the law. Now, this is something that we can read here, but you can also read about this in the book um, Acts and Monuments by uh, Fox, or Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you like that title more, because that book starts with a record of how all the different apostles have been martyred and killed. I'm just not sure what he writes about Peter. I have to go into that again, because, of course, we know that Peter was not crucified upside down in Rome. But you can read about this uh, stoning of James, the half-brother of Jesus. It says here, the brother of Jesus. No, no, no. We have to look at the littlest point, you know. It says, the brother mm -hmm. of Jesus. No, James was not the brother of Jesus. James was the half-brother of Jesus because he had the same mother. But he had Joseph, the husband of Mary, as father. Jesus That's Christ correct. had the Heavenly Father as Father. The Holy Spirit came over Mary and made her pregnant. Huh? So, James was the half-brother of Jesus. You see, it is sometimes so subtle. It is just maybe a word here and there missing, leading you astray. You cannot accept a written sentence that says, James, the brother of Jesus because he was only the half-brother. Now you say, of course, by Jörg, don't nitpick here. Um, you got it even in the, in the Gospels written when Jesus Christ was preaching to the multitude and one of his disciples came up to him and said, Jesus, your mother and your brother and your sister want to see you. And Jesus, Jesus turned around to the multitude he was preaching and saying, everyone who, everyone who listens to the word of God and who listens to my father is my, is my brother and my sister and my mother. Of course, he did not make that distinction there, because, you know, we are all in the body of Christ. We are all brothers and sisters, not half brothers and sisters, <laughs> but because we are brothers in the spirit. In the spirit, we are all brothers and sisters. But when it comes to the fleshly point, James, like also, uh, who was the other guy, um, 
Judas, uh, Jude, Jude wasn't wasn't he also a, a half brother of Jesus Christ? Sounds familiar. Judas, I mean, there were there were two of the Gospels that were written by mm -hmm. brothers of Jesus Christ. One was James for sure, and the other one I think was Judas. I'm I'm not sure if that was him. Anyway, the point is, they were half brothers in blood, yeah, worldly in this flesh scene in this materialistic world. So when we read this book, and we read of a historian, yeah because that's what they call him here, yeah? Josephus, a contemporary of the Apostles, writing specially for pagans, has left on record, so that means that, he's a in, that he is an historian, writing for pagans, has left on record that the brother of Jesus was James. And I expect of people who do so impertinent, important writings, correctness. And it should have said, the half-brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and others to be stoned as infractors of the law. Tacitus, the Roman historian who lived about 52 through 120 AD, so he also was a contemporary of the apostles, at least for a part, wrote in his annals, which deal with the period from AD 14 to 68, in book 15, page 44, quote, Christus, or Christ, as you say in English normally, but Jesus, uh, Jesus Christus, that's the name that we use in German, and that, of course, is the name um, the Roman historian uses, because Christus is the, um, Christus is the pronunciation of Jesus Christ in Roman. Yeah? Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. Now, it's interesting that we have this writing of Tacitus, but the problem is he lived between 52 and 120 AD. So, did he have his information firsthand? Did he have his information from eyewitnesses? Maybe he has had his information from eyewitnesses when he met some of the apostles, but then he must have met them very young, because most of the apostles, except for John, all were dying within the first 60, 70 years, within the first century, right? Um, therefore, you can go check on the Fox's Book of Martyrs to see when they were killed. But he is not an eyewitness. He just writes this down. Uh, he writes, he was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberias. I don't need a Roman historian to tell me that, because the Bible tells me exactly this. It's maybe interesting for some people outside of the Bible to have this Tacitus as a historian because he is confirming something that is inside the Bible, outside of the Bible. But I don't need it because he is not an eyewitness when he lived between 52 and 120 AD. I mean, he must have at least been 20 years of age before he came to a, let's say, uh, a state in his life a maturity, a, a, a uh, how, how do you say that? A uh, mat maturity, yeah, yeah, to mature, a maturity of an endless life where he can do works like this, and that would have been 72 AD. So he was no eyewitness of that. He just wrote, Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. That's the same as it says in the Bible already. So I don't need a Roman historian to tell me something that I can find in the Bible. It's no new news. Huh? He relates what measures were taken to eradicate Christianity and its adherents. How the early Christians were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set fire to and, when day declined, burned to serve for nocturnal lights. Mm. So this is about the first persecution that took place, most and for all, at the end of the 60s of the first century, as we learned earlier, after the Christians, quote-unquote, enlightened Rome, which they didn't. Nero did that for himself, but that's another story. Pliny the Younger, also a Roman and a friend of Tacitus, lived about 62 to 114 AD. So he is a contemporary, maybe, of a few of the apostles, but it's not known that he has known them. He was appointed proconsul of Bithynia, a province of Asia, in 103 AD. 
while there he wrote to Trajan, the emperor, respecting certain persons who had been charged before him with being Christians. He says in book 10 of his work, in letter 97, quote, They affirmed that the whole of their, vault, of their fault or error lay in this, that they were wont to meet together on a certain day, before it was light, and sing among themselves alternately a hymn to Christ as God, and bind themselves by an oath not to commit any wickedness, or be guilty of theft, or robbery, or adultery, never to falsify their word, or to deny a pledge committed to them when called upon to return it. Well, doesn't that sound just wonderfully? Don't you really think, oh, this is now at the end of this broadcast, finally something nice we hear, nice we read, that we cannot reject with biblical teaching? <laughs> no, I have to disappoint you. Because it says here, bind themselves by an oath. The Bible truly says not to take any oath on anything. So even this quote-unquote nice little quotation from Pliny the Younger has a problem with real biblical teaching because real Christians would never take an oath because it is forbidden. For sure, in Matthew chapter 5, I remember, if I remember correctly, and I think another time even in James. But you can look that up for yourself. Then you have something to do for the next time. Because here I rest my case for the reading of today. Maybe you have been disappointed when you measure this to earlier readings of mine. I don't care. I think I did the best I could with the understanding that I have. And I want to measure everything on the Bible. And when these years that the author tells us here are not to be seen out of the Bible directly, then it is presumption of man. And when these historians are writing things that are not biblically correct, then I point it out, and I rather take the Bible for true and make any every man a liar. And with that, I rest my case for today, and I give the word over to my brothers, Brett and Daryl. Please, brothers, who wants to start the finishing comments here? <laughs> Go ahead. Brad. Well, yes. Uh, you know, Yerk, um, this is uh, pretty much uh, a pretty big doozy here. I mean, not only are we dealing with uh, Roman history, but we're dealing with a uh, an author that... Um, he was, you know, maybe trying to do his best at the time he, when he wrote this, but certainly it's not without fault. I have to agree. Um, yeah, I, I, I have this trouble. Everybody, you know, listening, I have this trouble where I live at this time of year. We're at the end of winter, and we get slammed with all this snow and all these bills and and. Um, I'm sorry to complain about my flesh, but um, I have a hard time um, trying to process all this information in the morning like this because I'm generally more like Yerk. <laughs> and Yerk is how many hours ahead of me now? Eight hours or seven or something like that? Well, it's uh, five o'clock in the afternoon now. You're quarter past five. What time so is we're, your we're, place? We're we're kind of uh, a little bit out of synchronous as far as our minds are concerned, but I'll tell you that uh, I have to agree that this quote here is, you know, uh, taken with a grain of salt. It's not a biblical thing, and and to uh, to have an oath uh, with anything outside of Christ is um, not biblical. So, good work, Yerk. Thank you for the reading. really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity, Brad. It's wonderful to have this discussion. And, uh, uh, Daryl, did you have anything to add? 
The other thing I would say is uh, the thing I normally say, and that is uh, the primary book that we need to be reading, of course, is our Bible, and it's the old King James Bible, as opposed to the new King James, which is based on different manuscripts. But we need to, to be studying the entire Bible, both Old and New Testaments, and we need to be praying. And uh, there's a lot in the Bible about prayer, so... Uh, let's pray for one another. We need to be praying in general for discernment and wisdom and guidance because the deception out there is so great. And there's been a lot of even good books, as as pointed out here by Yerk. Uh, you have to be careful. The only book that's infallible is the Bible. And when men write books, they make mistakes. And we, we need to take the good and we, like... Uh, I hate to use the mention that uh, Eric John Phelps says this often, but it's true, is that uh, eat the meat and throw out the bones. Uh, don't assume that uh, that just because a Christian writes a book that everything in it is correct. That's not the case because, again, just like popes, uh, men are infallible. They're not infallible, excuse no, me. Fallible. Men are fallible. They're <laughs> yeah. fallible. They're fallible. Yeah, that's and there's right. no such thing as infallibility amongst men, even though popes claim it today. It's just not there. So, again, good to be on with both of you and uh, looking forward to the next reading. And, again, let's, let's uh, promote uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and oppose the Antichrist, the, the historical Antichrist, and that is the office of the papacy. Great. Thanks, Yerk and Daryl. And I think that's all we have for today. We're going to close it up. Yeah. So God bless everybody. We'll catch up with you next time. See you then. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, We will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor, that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.' 